Sorry, Kathy, we are now. <laughs> no, 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 they can just go on. <laughs> Okay. So those are our learning objectives for the day. So behavioral, pharmacologic management of behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. So at the, the same talk in AMDA, there were four of us who gave lectures, and right before me, Dr. Morley gave a talk on the non-pharmacologic management of BPSD. And so I will not be discussing those, although there should be enough time at the end of this if we want to discuss those and why Hopefully most of us in this room think that as a superior management for BPSD, we can certainly do so, but that was not what I was tasked to do. So I was tasked to review the literature on pharmacologic management. <clears throat> so what is BPSD? So other synonyms for this are the neuropsychological symptoms of dementia or non-cognitive. So we think about dementia as cognitive disorder, memory loss primarily. But there are also these non-cognitive symptoms that often families and caregivers struggle to control. Then they are... A little fuse. Okay. Five fuse. What is fuse? Fuse is just a way to... It's the way they record stuff. Um, all right. Uh, so these non-cognitive symptoms include aggression, apathy, depression, psychosis, and agitation. Uh, I'm find the one. And there are a variety. I was trying to get the pointer to work, but clearly we don't have a pointer on this. So these are some of the <coughs> potential neurotransmitter pathways that are thought to be involved, including dopamine, histamine, norepinephrine, acetylcholine, serotonin, glutamate. So these may sound familiar to you with neurotransmitter pathways that are also involved in delirium, as well as other aspects of how we might manage uh, pharmacologically people with dementia. So just keep that in mind that again, there are all of these different aspects of, of neurocognition that's going into this. So the prevalence ranges depending on the population at which we're studying, and it has a significant morbidity burden on, on our, our patients and their caregivers, both paid and, and formal caregivers. So what's really important is for us to distinguish the different types of BPSD because that's going to help us to target our therapy. So again, specifically talking about pharmacologic management, uh, you a lot of these are not going to be affected by the medications that we use. So you have to really be aware of what is happening. So there are the psychotic symptoms, which I think are probably the ones that we are most commonly called about and most commonly asked to prescribe medications for. There are the mood symptoms, such as depression and apathy. Apathy is probably the number one BPSD symptom that we see in dementia. Restless and agitated behaviors, again, this is a really common reason why people get institutionalized, put into nursing homes, and a reason why we get called to manage the patient's behaviors. And then disinhibition, so sexually inappropriate behavior is often something we get notified about. Um, and then other things such as hitting, striking, being socially inappropriate um, during the meal. <coughs> Trying to stab people with forks would probably be in, in this. We had a patient just <laughs> so. Uh, so again, here's my off-label disclaimer again. There have been no medications in the United States that have been approved by the FDA to treat BPSD. So there's not one medication that has been approved for this use. So anytime we are using a medication of any kind to target these symptoms, we are using them off-label. And that's very important because that goes into the discussions you have to have with the caregivers that are giving them the medication and family members and the patients themselves. So it's also important to know that none of these medications are, will slow the progression of the disease and they don't remove the cause or the trigger. So you constantly have to be looking for what is that underlying trigger. Maybe there's something going on that's actually causing this behavior as opposed to just the, the neurotransmitter pathways being off. And I'm also giving you some of my take-home points in advance. So now after this slide, you don't have to listen. But uh, so overall, there is not one drug class that has consistently been shown to be superior or better than another. So 
you can, we could sit at the end of the day and argue the literature for antipsychotics versus memantine, but in the end, the end of the day, the evidence is mixed for everything, and nothing has been shown to be better than another. And the broad range of drugs have been used and really come down to the comfort level of the prescriber and what we're familiar, familiar using for our patients. And that's typically when they've done the uh, the questionnaires asking prescribers why they chose the medicine, it's because they're most familiar with it and they think it has the lowest side effect profile and the lowest burden to the patient. Those are the reasons why. Not necessarily efficacy. So again, some more of my take-home points in advance of the data. It's really, really important to remember that BPSD waxes and wanes with the course of disease. So early on in dementia, you tend to get people who are more agitated, and later on, they have more resistance to care. And then that, so it changes. So, that's, so you have different BPSD symptoms depending on the stage of dementia. So the one thing about that is that you may be starting a medication when somebody's agitated, and all of a sudden the carer would say, oh, well, this medication clearly works. The patient's so much better as time goes on, the longer the patient's on the medicine. But it could just be the progression of the dementia itself, and they would just naturally come out of that type of BPSD. Um, and then they, so it goes in and out of when they would get that. Also, just because I'm going to be focusing on medications, we have to remember that non-pharmacologic management is always first line. And we always have to continue that even alongside the medications. I don't go into analgesics because that wasn't really the topic, but Typically, what you would kind of start with when you talk about pharmacologic management is if you suspect pain is a problem, that you use or analgesics for pain control. If you think that that might be an issue before just jumping to one of these other medicines I'm going to talk about. And then I made some algorithms. You may hate them, you may love them, but it's my understanding of the literature, what it says, and kind of helped me to frame it in a way that made me understand what the best data shows and maybe a way to approach pharmacologic management of BPSD. The other thing is we really need to do scheduled dose reductions and withdrawal trials once the person stabilizes. All right, so let's jump into the data. So antipsychotics. So we're going to start there because these are the most highly prescribed medications for this use. In 2001, so this data is a little bit old, but this was important to know, is the highest Medicaid expenditure in nursing homes. So we're spending a lot of money treating people with dementia with antipsychotics. And I'm going to show you that the evidence for this is not fantastic. We, they're often combined with other psychotropics, so the literature shows that up 50 to 80% of people who are on antipsychotics are also on benzodiazepines or antidepressants. So they're usually not being used alone. And oftentimes, unfortunately, people are using them for sedation as opposed to necessarily targeting that underlying treatment. So, uh, this again is old data. I, I, I have the newer percentages, but, I, but they're, they're very similar, so I didn't actually change that. So, there, it, it, it has been hovering right around 20% in nursing homes, actually. So, this is specifically a nursing home talk where antipsychotics have been used. For, and I'll show you some data about how that compares in the community as well. This overall is down, but it's still fairly high rates. And th this is the most, so the most commonly used philanthropine followed by risperidone, quetiapine, and haloperidol. Of note, I can't remember all the countries, so I know New Zealand, Australia, the UK, and maybe Italy. There's, there are four countries where risperidol is approved in, by their governing bodies for BPSD. However, even in those countries, it's one of the least likely to be prescribed. It, olanzapine and quetiapine are more likely to be prescribed, even though they're not, not approved by their governing bodies to be used there. So, and again, the evidence suggests that none of these, you can't say, well, this one is clearly better than the other in the same class for treatment of these conditions. Although, Haloperidol, you might argue, has the best evidence of efficacy, but it also has the best evidence for harm. So that's why we typically <clears throat> avoid our haloperidol. And then, again, it's really important to not only understand the type of BPSD you're seeing, but also what type of dementia does the person have. Because these are absolutely contraindicated in dementia with Lewy body because you're going to make their Parkinsonism worse. 
and you're actually going to make their agitation worse and potentially their psychosis as well using antipsychotics. So you get a paradoxical effect. So we don't use that in dementia of the body. That's what DLB means. So these are the guidelines specifically for nursing home patients and when you can and cannot use antipsychotics, it gives a guide to the nursing home. So they actually do say that you can use them in people with dementia and delirium with psychotic disorders as long as you justify it and provide documentation. So in our nursing homes, everybody's trying to get down to 0%, we're well, not going to get there. But the most important thing is that we're justifying the use and that we're making sure we're doing other things <coughs> as well for the people. Uh, there are things that do not justify antipsychotics, including wandering, being uncooperative, so people who are fighting in the showers, resisting care, that's not a reason to use antipsychotics. And then anything, anybody who's agitated, who's not an immediate threat to anybody else or himself, should not be prescribed an antipsychotic. So that's really important. As well as some of these other uh, BPSD symptoms that would be better treated with other uh, uh, things such as you know, anti-anxiety, or anxiety, fidgeting, insomnia, and uh, social issues. All right. So of the ones that are most commonly used, which do have the best evidence? If we're going to say, okay, pick your poison, which one are you going to pick? So the two that have the most amount of evidence, this doesn't necessarily mean these are great medicines to use, but the ones that have the most amount of evidence are risperidone and lens. So there are five trials, these are randomized trials, including three of them in the nursing homes that did show a statistically significant reduction in aggression and psychosis. The doses they used were one to two milligrams per day, and they, they titrated up to these. So they usually started low and then titrated up depending on their, uh, their aggression score. A lot of them use Behave AD or the Neuropsychiatric Index. Uh, and then they all, all the olanzapine study held they had two nursing home studies with mixed results. Again, they had better efficacy at higher doses, but at the risk of adverse events. So when they titrated up to 10 milligrams, they actually saw impermanent symptoms, but they had a lot more adverse events, and people discontinued the trials once they got up to that high dose. So uh, that's, that's the issue with that. Now this, I like these plots here because they kind of, they break it down based on the best evidence that we have in terms of efficacy of the antipsychotics for BPSD. So aripiprazole actually shows the, that it favors the treatment the most. The rest of them all approach or cross the zero line, which means the confidence intervals are approaching or over one, which means you don't have statistical significance. When you take all of this data together, there is a slight statistical benefit of antipsychotics overall for BPSD. However, when you translate that into clinically meaningful data, it doesn't translate. So just because there's statistical significance doesn't mean that there's clinically significant benefit. And that's what these authors showed was that, yeah, we have statistical significance, but, when, but the clinical benefit is probably not there. So really not good evidence to use these for, for reduction of antipsychotics. In addition, we have to be very, very cautious because there are lots of adverse events that occur with antipsychotics. Drug-drug interactions, increasing pneumonias, particularly aspiration pneumonias, probably from sedation, TIA strokes, falls, hip fractures, extrapyramidal side effects, hyperprolactinemia, cardiac arrhythmias, and mortality. And the stroke and mortality they think is orthostatic hypotension, thromboembolic effects, sedation, and then atherosclerosis from the hyperprolactinemia. So we have to be really, really, these are dangerous medications that have, yes, statistical difference, but very small clinical benefits in the trials. There's also a black box warning against all the antipsychotics. It came out in 2005. So here's 2005 right here. So this is, this is the use of antipsychotics over time. So we started going up, 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 up. Then the FDA said, wait a minute, there's increased risk of strokes, cardiovascular events, and death if you use these in people with dementia. So then you see that right after 2005, it goes up just a little bit, but then progressively has gone down. So people are paying attention and are listening to this. And then you see here that, um, so these are the community dwelling individuals down here, and then uh, the nursing home patients at the top. So 
while I find that in my practice, I end up prescribing these medications a lot more in the home because the families are just really at their wit's end, it's clearly not the trend. So the trend is that people in nursing homes are getting a lot more antipsychotics than people in the community with dementia. It shouldn't really be surprising, but it's unfortunate. Uh, so the next several slides are to suggest that if you acquire a patient on an antipsychotic for BPSD, or if you trial someone on it and they stabilize, this is the point where you should do a scheduled dose reduction. And the reason is that it does benefit. So what this data here shows you is that the people who were kept on their antipsychotic versus the people who were successfully uh, redu reduced off of their medications, there was no difference in their symptoms that, in a year from then. So you can take people off and they're not necessarily going to rebound and get those effects again. Now. What they did find was that people who were worse at baseline, who had much worse agitation, so when they looked at the neuropsychiatric inventory, the NPI, if that score was, let's see, which is worse, it was greater than 14, those people had a higher risk of relapse than people who were not as agitated at baseline. So that's just something to keep in mind. But we were, they were able to successfully get people off of that. And what they were able to show in addition to not relapsing and being able to successfully stay off from a behavioral standpoint is they actually had mortality benefit as well. As you continue to follow them out up to 54 weeks, there was a, 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 a survival benefit from coming off their antipsychotics. So, take home point, if they're on one, they're stabilized, <coughs> we should try to get them off of it if possible. Questions about antipsychotics before long? Yeah. I'm just baffled that we use these drugs so much and there's no evidence behind them. Like, this is horrible. Yeah. It is, but I'll show you as we move on, there's no evidence for any of them. So we get stuck between a rock and a hard place. I don't really feel they make a difference. I often wish I could stop all of the, like, antidepressants and everything because I don't really feel in the nursing home that probably any of it really matters and, and probably in most cases it doesn't but there's so much placebo effect yeah somebody was telling me did you were you part of that conversation where the the placebo effect conversation yeah, yeah I think was it Marla I think she was I can't remember yeah that even when Somebody's people about knew they were taking a placebo they said I know this is mm -hmm. placebo but I feel better and I want to keep taking it and so there's strong placebo effect, not just for the patient. I think it's for the staffers. Because there are, yeah. actually are trials of placebo versus nocebo. <laughs> yeah. Okay, versus an active wow. comparator. And, and the, pl the placebos are always effective, and the nocebos are where they don't even give them a placebo. They say, we're doing a clinical trial of you getting nothing. Okay? Yeah. Randomized. And the price of the placebo makes better, like expense of the placebo, which surely they're going to Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if people pay for their placebo, placebo. yeah, they, they, yeah, they get a benefit. So, <laughs> yeah. 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 How did they get that through the IRB? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> probably not the same. It's, probably it, not. It, well, it's certainly it's not. True. True. It's true. And, and you know, it, we're the only country, well, not really. We're not the only country. There are a lot of countries don't. But, where, um, but there are some countries that say the evidence is good enough to go ahead and to approve at least risperidone for that use. But, you know, it, it is, and as far as I know, that's one of the only ones in the world that's approved for, this, for the use of this. So benzo, so benzo. So oftentimes with the antipsychotics, we're not going to use those. And we say, well, the next best poison is the benzo. So let's go to that. So what is the evidence for this? Again, looking at all evidence, but specifically targeting nursing homes, that was the, what the talk was looking at. There are five randomized control trials, specifically for BPSD and, and benzodiazepines. Only one had placebo. So most of them looked at old benzo versus new benzo, or old benzo versus old benzo, or uh, uh, new benzo versus uh, second or first generation antipsychotic. So really <laughs> horrible trials. And only one was a nursing home study, so all the rest were in the community. They, they were all very kind of weirdly done. Some of them had three groups. The placebo group had four, so it was three different types of medications against placebo. So it was a very, they were all very, very weird. 
They're and all, none of them show benefit. <laughs> What's that? They're all drug company sponsors. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. And and even with that, none of them showed efficacy between any of the medications. No difference in efficacy between any of the medications. So the evidence does not exist for the use of benzodiazepines to treat BPSD. It's just basically we, we don't have any evidence that it benefits. Uh, the Beers criteria says that we sh they should be avoided for insomnia, agitation, or delirium. And in some patients, and I'm sure it has to do with the type of dementia, there's evidence of paradoxical reaction where there's actual disinhibition with the benzodiazepines, so you get further agitation and aggression. So you have to always be conscious that maybe that's occurring. Probably, my guess, is also the people that are contraindicated for the antipsychotics, dementia with Lewy body, or frontotemporal dementia are one of those that have a lot of agitation and aggression to begin with, they're going to get disinhibited. Questions on the So it's all very well to say don't use them. I know. But <laughs> no, but I will get to that at the end. Okay, I, but, I will get but to that at the end. if you're I'm going just... to look at the side effects of short-acting benzos versus antipsychotics, they're virtually none compared to the antipsychotics. So if you're going to finish up using something, then most probably are safer. You've got a choice. I mean, yeah, you're going to finish up whether you like it or not using some of these medicines in the real world, uh, you know, unless you're prepared to have the nurses strangle you. Uh, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and so, and, and clearly, many of these patients need something, and whether it's placebo or not, you're yeah. going to have to give them something. So this is always the problem. We go through all of this. Yeah. And I know at the end you're going to have to say, well, I'm going to give them and I'm going to decide which one. You have to but, decide which one. but I think. But yeah, when my task was just to show you about the evidence. But much of the Benzo data was on long acting, was on the diazepams, Librium, and people decided they were horrible because of that, not because of the short acting. And we have to remember yeah. that's yeah. where that data came yeah, from, because it. the AGS in price. particular, who I tend to hate, Really keep on pushing this with no real good data. The, the data is very poor. Yeah, and there's so some this good is... data in delirium, but specifically like post-operative and ICU delirium, mm -hmm. where the pretty good there's pretty good evidence for we can't use this in the nursing home precedence right. as being. Um, both preventive and effective treatment, but in addition to that, there's some evidence for Haldol being for post-operative, specific, specific post preventive yeah. for post-operative delirium, and, and the benzos, right, and the benzos in the perioperative setting and also for just ICU, severely ill people. The benzos look very bad. But they were long-acting benzos. No, no, no. These are short-acting. And the Medazolam. They, yeah, well, that's, Adivan. you know, Adivan, I haven't seen that literature. The, There's uh, three meta-analysis that just came out, two yeah. antipsychotic, one benzos in delirium in the last three years, and all of them are negative. Yeah. I mean, there's not a lot of data. That's the problem. No. You know, you've got to have data to be able to say something. And you've got to give me an alternative. Because so now we're going to go to some of the other ones that people will turn to when they don't like these first two that seem more dangerous. So the anticholinesterase inhibitors. So BPSC has been associated with imbalances of acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Acetylcholinesterase. Where they have aggression, depression, hallucinations, and particularly sleep disturbances. That's kind of the biggest thing. So they studied all of these different medications. Most of this were dementia trials looking at memory, and then they did postdoc analysis or secondary analysis. So again, you have to take that all with a grain of salt. But donepazil did not show behavioral improvements overall, and can paradoxically increase agitation, probably related to sleep disturbances is what they were seeing. And then uh, galantamine, the risk of these outweighed the benefits, so they had much more side effects than maybe others in the class. That was also true in the beginning. And then rivastigmine, of the anticholinesterase inhibitors, rivastigmine has the best evidence that it reduces agitation, it was particularly the topical form. And this were people 
the trials did Alzheimer's dementia, so, um, but, but very mixed. So again, the evidence is mixed. There's nothing that consistently says it helps. But of this class of medicines, denepazole galantamine did not show benefit. Rivastigmine showed mixed benefit. Mamantine, so uh, the NMDA receptor antagonist, again, when they looked at the trials for memory and they did all their post hoc secondary analysis, they said, oh, look, we reduced aggression and agitation in these people with Alzheimer's disease. So clearly, we should be touting this medication to be used for that purpose. So uh, what they found was that initially, wow, with significant benefits over placebo, but then, uh, with aggressive uh, delusions, agitation. But then they did more recent studies specifically looking at this, for that was their primary outcome, and they failed to find any significant benefits. So we got all excited about this medication because we looked at secondary analysis, which you should never prescribe based on that. And then that the most recent studies did not show that specifically for these symptoms of dementia, if you don't have another indication for which you would start the medicine, it did not help. What would be another indication? Because it doesn't work for memory either. So the <laughs> question. <laughs> well, so, I, I just don't I understand. Question. Whenever I get a jury site consult, I always get it's usually for behavior. So then I always get them started on Aricept and Namenda, and I never understand why. There's nothing else for them. Yeah. So they've got the same problem as we've got. There's yeah. nothing else, and yeah. they they have no other drugs. And they can't even give an antihypertensive, yeah. so you know they very. Yeah. But look, with mamantine, to be fair, blocks NMDA. But that's there's for a, pain, right? Yeah, there's a small subset of people who have pain, and that subset. So the original study mm -hmm. showed about four out of a hundred people got better, and if you went back and looked, those were the people with pain. So it most like probably it is, I mean, well, it's effects. not, it's, it's per, like propoxyphene, which we got rid of, but propoxyphene was a wonderful drug for people who had chronic ongoing pain, and it was a small subset of people, and everybody else got it and got addicted to it, so we had to get rid of it, but for that small subset, it actually worked. And so this is an expensive yeah. propoxyphene, expensive. is the way I look at it. Which is probably why you saw more of a benefit in the agitation group. Than in the delusion hallucination. So anticonvulsants. So this is the one that I see most commonly when I have a patient in over in uh, So digalproic sodium or depakote. Now the all the initial reports. So all of the anticonvulsants, interestingly, have a huge body of evidence. So I read a lot of articles on the anticonvulsants. But there were small trials, poorly designed, most of them were not randomized controlled trials, most of them were case reports, and so all the initial reports, there were several different studies that showed, oh well, this seemed to be more effective and then and safer for our nursing home patients. So, and when I first started reading these articles, I was like, why are we not using this more? And then you start to really look into the literature and they did do five randomized controlled trials that showed that it was not effective for BPSD. And there were an excess of adverse events in this group. <coughs> so that's why we don't use this more than we do. Uh, same thing with uh, topiramate, topiramate and lamotrigine. It seemed to show a lot of evidence in the open label trials and case reports. We have no randomized control trials of these. So if it follows the other anticonvulsants, we might expect the same data. Gabapentin side effect profile may be more acceptable. Again, lots of different small little studies, case reports, case series. It was one retrospective chart review is it for gabapentin. So nobody's, <coughs> nobody has done a study, at least up until March of 2016, looking at gabapentin for, for agitation and BPSD. And they used a wide range of doses, all the way from the smaller dose of 300 all the way up to 2400 a day. So really wide doses that they used in this study, and there's some evidence that's not good for people with dementia of the body. Again, probably because it's gathered. Um, carbamazepine, and they had nine open label trials. Some showed really good evidence of benefit, others didn't show any at all. There were two randomized controlled trials that did show some statistical benefit but there was a question of, of its safety, so it had more adverse effects, effects on a placebo. So the conclusion out of these two randomized controlled trials is that probably the risk outweighs the benefit for carbamazepine. But of the antipsychotics, it, it, it has the best evidence for benefit. So ox 
carbamazepine can't be recommended, valproic acid, uh, poor tolerability, really, and then the, no evidence really of efficacy. And then the carbamazepine has the best evidence, but again, what is the risk? So you have to re recall that it has a lot of uh, poor tolerability. So these medicines really aren't well tolerated. Um, the antidepressants. So the big question about antidepressants is, does this help people with apathy? So apathy being the number one BPSD that we see, while it's probably not the one we get called about, because they're apathetic, they're not agitated, so why would we get called? Uh, it's different from depression. And it probably is not going to be benefited from using these medications. So apathy wouldn't necessarily get benefit, but if they're depressed, they might. And so I think that's where the trials didn't necessarily distinguish that very well, and that's where people have that question. So with mixed evidence overall, the evidence says there's no benefit for trazodone, fluoxetine, or sertraline. The best evidence was for citalopram, but that trial used 30 milligrams per day, and that, that exceeds the FDA approved dose of 20. So we wouldn't use that dose anyway. So again, we have no evidence that it benefits. Um, they, there was some, some comparator studies, again, small, poorly designed study, uh, studies, but um, really didn't show any benefit over antipsychotics in terms of efficacy. So antipsychotics showed no effect, they showed no effect. Yeah. <laughs> so. I, I don't understand, I mean, I understand that the, the request is, usually it's the family, but not always. No, I don't understand why apathy needs to be treated in someone with moderate to severe dementia. Okay? I don't understand why it even needs to be treated, other than that it bothers somebody else. Yeah. Well, well, because they do nothing. And people who do nothing and don't them. exercise have a really bad outcome. I mean, your choice is you could say that the best treatment for everybody with dementia is you shoot them when they come into the nursing home. Now, I'm, I'm teasing, but, you know, we're stuck with this group of people who are real problems, and we've got to find a way to do something with them. Only a pr it's only a problem if you define it as a problem based on an absurd assumption that people who have been undergoing either a precipitous or gradual but relentless decline are somehow supposed to improve when they hit the end of the line. Yeah, but you, you can't have people who just sit, who don't move in the nursing home. Why? <laughs> For multiple reasons, starting with the fact they're going to get pressure ulcers, they're going to actually do poorly, so and, and you can take your choice. No matter what you do. No, no. So, would you like me to treat I think your there are ways to treat these people, <laughs> you get there. but right. I don't there think drugs are the only That was going to be my point, is that apathy is not treated with drugs. And that's the point from this talk, is that there are other more effective means of treatment that aren't drugs. And so, but the problem is people love apathy and depression together and try to treat both with drugs. It is hard to distinguish. Yeah, yeah, it is. It and is. there's actually so. very little evidence that treating depression with drugs in nursing homes actually it's works because all the studies actually have a psychotherapeutic piece as well. You've got to realize that the nurse who comes in, in and is the study nurse talks to the oh, patient. The they yeah. do a series of things that nobody counts as part of it. Visiting. Yeah, and so they visit. You know, you have friendly visitors, the worst. You know. Yeah. Well, in this study, doesn't, there, there were no placebos. So we don't know that they didn't get any benefit from them, but there was not benefit one versus the other. So then all of our phase are it. Dextromethorphan quinidine, um, which is an expensive way of combining cough syrup and tonic water. So the, the, the dextromethorphan has NMDA receptor antagonist properties. It also has sigma-1 receptor agonist serotonin reuptake inhibition, possibly some other effects. So again, you're looking at that whole melee of neurotransmitters and is it affecting all these different things, right? So if you just give dextromethorphan, it doesn't last very long in the body. So you add quinidine and that actually increases its bioavailability and, and, it, and its half-life, so it sticks around longer. So that's why you add the tonic water to your cough medicine. Mm -hmm. um, and it only has FDA approval for pseudo-vulgar affect, not for anything else. So again, that's what we're, we're looking at. 
So there was one randomized dub double-blind control trial that looked specifically at dextromethorphan quinidine in patients with dementia with BPSD, with agitation. And they did show a clinically or a statistically significant reduction in the MPI score. Now, the thing you have to understand about this population, number one, the drug dose was much higher than what's approved. So you don't, we don't even prescribe this, medic, this dose. So do we know that it works at 2010? We have no idea. Two, the groups were very different. So the placebo group had higher agitation scores at baseline. So they may have both improved, but you still saw a difference. And so they were not, you were not comparing apples to apples. And while there were more falls in the, in the medication group, they also had more falls at baseline. So these groups were not the same in, in any way, the way they looked at them. So it really is hard to interpret this data. And this is all a lot of statistical play without uh, a whole lot of, of understanding of the, of the real clinical impact for this. So, so you're saying if we give any of these at a high enough dose to put the person to sleep, yes. agitation disappears, yeah. okay. which is okay. what it is. So then it comes down to choosing to the agent that puts people to sleep the easiest and has the least side effects, you yeah. know, because we've got to put people to sleep. I mean, yeah, that's, that's what we're right. doing. You know. It's the alternative Oops. to shooting them. Okay. <laughs> it's just there. So this again, Milta Little's algorithm. I did not get this from anybody. I built this myself. And so you can hate it and never look at it again. <laughs> or you can say this kind of makes a little bit of a sense based on what you told me. So when you have somebody who's BPSD, you're called or you're assessing someone with BPSD, first thing you do is to assess the type. Because if we have no idea what is actually going on, the person's agitated, and we have no idea really what's happening, or person the person's depressed. We don't know how to target our therapy. So we need to know what actually is going on. And then, of course, the non-pharmacologic interventions. Assessing for those unmet needs. Is there pain? Do they just, uh, do they need to walk? Do they want water? Are they afraid of the dog that walked in? Are, you know, what is happening? What are those unmet needs that we need to look at? So um, all of them, non-pharmacologic management first. Uh, was it effective? Yay! Yeah, so we continue to monitor, and that's um, unfortunately not as often as we hope for it to, to work in, in real practice, although I think most of the time we don't really give it a good college try. Um, very few people exercise people seven days a week for at least half an hour and an hour, which works very well when our medical students do it. I mean, that's the problem. Exercise works better than any, but nobody wants to do it. You know, and it's hard to get them to exercise. They're right? apathetic. You can get them to exercise. I can get anybody to exercise except myself. <laughs> so most of the time, um, well, not I should say most of the time, it's some of the time it's not effective, and so then what's the next thing to do? So I put in there stepwise analgesics because we have to remember that those are drugs, and so it's a pharmacologic management of BPSD. And I also suggest that based on the literature that suggests that people with an NPI of greater than 14 are going to respond better to the medications most likely and will probably not do as well with the scheduled dose reduction. It's nice to know at baseline what that is. So to check the NPI at that point before starting a medication, trial them a medication, and the goal is always to do short-term treatment and to have a plan for reducing medications as soon as the person stabilizes. These aren't medicines that the person should have all the way through to the end of their life. We should always have a plan of when are we going to start looking at stopping, and that should be part of the communication with all of the caregivers, including the, the caregivers in the nursing home or in the community and family members. Um, and then those MPI greater than 14, some of those we might consider doing that long term, especially if they've already failed to schedule dose reduction, then we might be stuck keeping that for a while. But again, remembering that towards the end of, of end-stage dementia, their BPSD changes and we just didn't need any of these medications. So with stepwise analgesics, how much morphine can I give them? To get I, can, I, I can give everyone <laughs> with morphine. <laughs> Yeah, you know, when, when they're not breathing, uh, basically, I guess I'm going to stop. I, I give Tylenol, and often enough, that's all you it, need. People yeah, don't pain give, medication don't works. I'm not arguing for the people mm -hmm. who've got They'll pain. They'll give 350, 325 of Tylenol, you know, three times a day, and it's not enough. You have to push the dose. Well, I mean, I, I'll give yeah. 650 four times, four times, and I'll double the dose. 
and it actually does, and then your Tylenol yeah. levels get to virtually nowhere if you don't have liver disease. We, could, we looked at this 20 years ago, because we, everybody was saying, well, your doses are far too high. It isn't, and it actually, you reach a stage with Tylenol where you can actually get some positive effects, but most people need a lot of it, not the homeopathic things that we take. Okay. All right, so then I kind of parceled it out a little bit in terms of, again, this is what the data shows. This is not necessarily what people think are best practice or what we might be comfortable doing. So four to eight week drug trial is typically what they recommend of these different things. If you have agitation, so agitation and psychosis are usually treated differently in the trials. Agitation and you have Alzheimer's disease where you think you would use some of these medications and you might have some hopes that it might improve, uh, stall or delay the course of the disease. Ribostigmine transdermal has the best evidence or um, amantine and they, they titrated those up to 10 BID in the trials. If it's very severe, these are the people who use a short course of an antipsychotic with the goal of getting them off as soon as possible. And then uh, the last line would be carbamazepine in this group. So this was the, for agitation, that was the best evidence. The psychosis, these are the two that, were, that have the best evidence. So risperidone starting at 0.5 milligrams daily and titrating up to 1, 1 milligram BID. So above that is when people really had a lot of side effects and it way outweighed the benefits. So you don't, if they're not benefiting at that point, you don't push it any higher. Same with the lanzapine. Anytime they got above 7.5, so once they give them 10 milligrams per day, they really had lots of adverse events and starting low and going slow. Um, and then haloperidol had some evidence in some benefit for people who are at low risk of extrapyramidal side effects. Um, and then mood disorders, the really the only one with any evidence would be the citalopram. And again, I would not go to 30 milligrams, so I'm not advocating for that. But uh, usually the recommendation is 10. There's no evidence for those doses, but that may be. And then limited, there, in the absence of anxiety, there's limited role for benzodiazepines just for new disorders. So for anxiety, maybe. Okay. So, Multa, if you did that at Maryland Heights, you'd have about 30% of people on antipsychotics. Well, this is if they failed. Uh, Non-pharmacologic, which I think no, that I, we are very... And we do some of that. I mean, we do more at Maryland Heights than most nursing homes. It's really sad, but that's where it is. Uh, but if you look at that, I mean, that's what we were at one stage. We were on about 30% antipsychotic. The state said you can't be on 30%, and we're now down at 30 All we've done is we've just increased the uh, anxiolytics. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, and it's a trade-off. Something's got to put the person to so, sleep. Yeah. You have your choice. How are you going to put the person to sleep? But, you know, anesthetic works, uh, morphine works. But it's really so knocking the person out for like two. So that's not, yeah, it's no, not, I mean, but you, you're stuck with something. I mean, none of these agitation, I don't believe, Anything there actually works till you knock the person out. Like, you know, when they've really got agitation, and we, those are the people hitting the noses and stuff. The, those, the river stick, we are not going to work. And uh, the psychic... This is just... Uh, like, no, I, I know. I'm not, I'm not giving you a bad time, because this is roughly it, what online. people say. But yeah. there's no good literature to say it. And we've really worked on this at Maryland Heights. You yeah. know, we spent a lot of time in QA trying to work out yeah. how to fix people. And the problem yeah. is, too, is that the, now that with the new five-star ratings, they're looking at benzos. While it's not included in the five-star, they're, they're looking at it. So now they're coming around and that's going to be included. But too. It's so we're going to have to find a different It's the same thing as, as you can't use, you remember, you can't <laughs> use opiate analgesics anymore in old people. They're going to stop you using them and then they won't understand why old people are agitated and in pain. Yep. They want you to have no pain. You know, so you, then you push the Tylenol dose too high and they complain. You, know, you can't, I mean, the reality is somebody has to come up with a way to do it. I think to some extent we've done it at Maryland Heights because I think that people do better with anxiolytics. You know, do we have more falls? I don't know, but we've had the same number of falls where yeah. we have lots of antipsychotics or lots of well, anxiolytics. Well, the problem is, I mean, somebody should do the studies yeah. because that's the issue is that we don't have evidence to put this to say. We have evidence to use these benzodiazepines. And so if people did the studies, I don't know. And it's, Probably would show the same thing as The other thing with anxiolytics is if you lose 
very low doses, so that way you can get away with extraordinarily low doses of something. The problem is people usually start off with higher doses and they escalate very quickly. So I think, I mean, I just truly believe that anxiolytics in our experience have worked so much better than anything else and don't have all the bad side effects. I mean, if you put together the side effects, all of these others in some way affect the heart. They cause basically uh, strokes, they cause myocardial infarction. Benzos don't tend to do that, you know, they've got limited bad side effects. Yeah. Uh, falls, but, you know, if you're going to make somebody sleepy, they're going to fall. <laughs> We're stuck. I, I, I just I stuck. I think as a group we use very little antipsychotics, but... We, we, yeah, but, but we have truly traded off to yeah. going to anxiolytics. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong. There is no data, but right. if they tell you you can't that's use probably, antipsychotics... That's probably why, because we have data that shows these don't work, so we might as well go to something even if we don't have. I, we I don't we have data answer. that these don't, that these harm. And I think we don't, we don't have data that benzos benefit, we also don't have... And I mean, Mamanti drops the blood pressure to nothing, and so if, unless you're watching the blood pressure very carefully, the way it tends to work is it gives you no uh, oxygen to the brain, which is very good to stopping bad behavior, okay? Which, which medicine? Mamanti. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's really bad that way. Uh, and rivastigmine yeah, has more side effects than any of the any other anticholinesterase inhibitors. The reason they went to the transdermal was because they had so many side effects nobody would use they the oral. Effects, when so. they went to the transdermal, what they showed is there were less side effects than you were getting with rivastigmine, but still many, much more side effects than you get with Arasect. So, you know, so the question yeah. is, do you use drugs? Yeah. No, those trials didn't, it wasn't ribostigmine transdermal versus oral, like this versus placebo. Yeah. But I don't, so I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm stuck every time I, I know. this. I know. I, I, mean, I, I know the answer is to I do... I was told, asked to give this talk, yeah, and so I, I did the best that I could with this. I mean, the, the answer I'm I pretty know. certain is to do psychological interventions yeah. and huge numbers of them. But that takes lots of people, lots of money, which is not available, or is not, I mean, if we took all the money that was wasted on all these drugs and put it into giving maybe one or two extra people to do activities, Absolutely. you most probably would finish up that you were better. And somebody needs to, like you, who needs to go to CMS and offer to do that trial and say, look, we will pay us to have enough activities for people <coughs> and we will get rid of all your drugs. And you most probably will get rid of all your drugs. Mm -hmm. Or a lot of them. You can't do it when they hallucinate. You know, you've right. got to recognize hallucinations, yes. delusions are totally different when they bother them. I think a lot of the problem is that you don't really know what you're treating. All right. of this oh, yeah. is based on no idea. you standing there looking at somebody who can't tell you what's going on, and so you classify their motor and verbal behavior just like you were watching, you know, a, a monkey farm, and there's no blood test or scan or anything else that's supposedly more objective to tell you what it is. But you're treating, so what, it's it's no matter what you do, it's it's rank empiricism, but, and one shouldn't be. So what you're seeing here is them. trying to do exactly the same thing as the sprint tel trial tells you to do, which is <coughs> to treat blood pressure down to 130 or 120, which is fine as long as you put somebody in a quiet room for 10 minutes, do the blood pressure three times, which is how they did it, with nobody in the room, with nobody in the room and a, a quiet room, not bright light. It's something like our office has been for the Music. last couple of days. <laughs> yeah, it was. You know, and, and so it takes 10 minutes to move the person just to do the blood pressure. Now, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that's not the right way. I think it is the right way to do blood pressure. But the reality is you can't do blood pressure that way. This is the same sort of thing. We're, I mean, a lot of what we're treating is some, somebody, usually a nurse's aide or something, comes up to somebody and upsets them. And you're treating somebody who you know gets upset. I mean, the classical one is they come up behind somebody and say hello, and the person turns around and hits them. You know, and, and I mean, that's a normal response, but you see all sorts of responses in the nursing home, and without really good uh, behavioral uh, stuff, you can't get there. 
uh, you know, if you use the mindfulness approaches, you can go down. But that's hugely time consuming to do this. And nobody wants to pay for this extra set of people. I mean, uh, I can't find anybody who's going to pay for it. And uh, as I say, we, we, when we have students in the nursing home, we find ways. I'm waiting to see if our snoozle and room worked, and I'm betting it did work because the students spent a lot of time with the person. You know? So when we look at the results, I'm betting they all got better with the snoozle and room. Though the nurses say it doesn't get them better, but they go there for five minutes and they've got to go do something, so they pull them out. You know? mm -hmm. That's the problem. You've got to have somebody sitting in the room with them, and I'm betting it's going to make them better. It doesn't work in the hospital with the student in there. Hmm? It's there not a student. Remember, the student and the nurse who did the social in the room were active placebos. They were very involved with the, the residents when they were there. No, we didn't tell them to go in and just sit there and look at them. We told them to <coughs> be a companion, you know, <coughs> in a, a social room. And that can work. There's no reason. It's, and that's how when those studies work, is you've got lots of companionship. But where do you get this from? But at least we don't have physical restraints, unlike the hospital. This is true. You know, so we've got a little further. And the hospital uses at least as much antipsychotics, if not more. Particularly starting in genocide. If you don't get too carried away. <laughs> And Dr. Grossberg would, if he gave this talk, would tell you these things really do work by the way. I've heard him give this talk and he points out that some of these things in his mind that he reads the literature work, usually in studies that he's been involved in with the production. What data